well, it'll even be harder to stay awake, won't it, after that meal? Uh, but I, uh, I, I know you'll do your best. <coughs> Let's just take a look at that chart again of the kings and prophets of Israel and Judah. Because what we've seen in our sessions this afternoon is that we had... Uh, I don't know if you've seen this one, but you're going to see it a couple of times. We had a Babylonian apostasy in Israel in the times of Ahab and Jezebel. And now in this session we're going to have a look at the Babylonian apostasy in Judah. Now this is very important in relation to Zechariah chapter 5. <clears throat> because we're going to see uh, that there's a, con a connection, there's a link. The, the city of Samaria was the centre of Babylonian worship in Israel under Ahab and Jezebel. The city of Jerusalem is the centre of Babylonian worship under King Manasseh and his son Ammon. And so these two cities are very important, Samaria and Jerusalem, because the two women of Zechariah 5 represent Samaria and Jerusalem. So we're going to see that link a little bit later on in our final uh, study for this evening. Now that's where we're heading uh, in this session and the next session. Now I think most of us are quite familiar with the history of the latter years of the Kingdom of Judah. And we have that period where um, from Hezekiah onwards there's a disaster. Manasseh, uh, who comes to the throne at age 12, begins a long process of apostasy which culminates in his being taken off to Babylon by the Assyrians. So how did Assyria and Babylon come into Judah? We want to have a look at what happened in that history. Well, it goes right back to Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. He brought the design of an Assyrian altar to Jerusalem in 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 10 and 11. You remember how the prophet Isaiah came to Ahaz and said, oh, from Yahweh, ask me a sign. Ask a sign and I'll give it to you. He says, I'm not interested, I don't believe in Yahweh anyway. So when he sought help against his enemies, reason, uh, uh, and the king of Syria and the king of Israel, he sent to the Assyrians for that help. Now by the way, brethren, this is the pattern for what is going to happen in the very near future. This is the pattern for Israel to make a covenant with the latter day Assyrians. Russia, right? And Israel is already in the process of moving down that path. And I can give you evidence about that. It'll come. An Israeli government will one day make an agreement with Russia. And that is there in the record of the times of Ahaz and Hezekiah. We won't go into that now. The Assyrian invasion under Sennacherib in the reign of Hezekiah, of course is a critical event, isn't it? Because it's the prophetic basis of what's going to happen in the latter days. We know that from the prophecy of Isaiah. And Manasseh introduced Babylonian idolatry and astral worship into Judah. We're going to have a look at some of the texts. I want you to come to Second of Kings, chapter 21. This is the text that tells us about the idolatry of Manasseh. 2 Kings 21, and at verse 2, we read. We read about Manasseh in verse 1. He was 12 years of age when he came to the throne. In verse 2, he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh after the abominations of the nations whom Yahweh cast out before the children of Israel. So what did he do? Verse 3. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed and he reared up altars for Baal and made a grove as did Ahab king of Israel and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. So what happened in the north under Ahab and Jezebel is now happening many years later in Judah. He does exactly the same thing that Ahab had done. 
He brought every form of Baal worship, Nimrod worship, into Judah that he could. Goes on to talk about the extent of that apostasy. All these Phoenician gods of the sun and the moon all had their origins uh, in Babylon. That's where Baal and Asherah came. Asherah, of course, is Astar. Astar, Ishtar. Ishtar, Astar, Semiramis. Right? <laughs> so it goes right back to Semiramis. So here we've got that worship coming into Judah. <clears throat> it mentions the host of heaven there in verse 3. Now this is astral worship of the Chaldeans. They worship the sun, the moon and the stars. They had the signs of the zodiac. I mean, a lot of people in this world can't live without looking up their stars each day. Now they've got to, they have the signs of the zodiac at work for them. Well, that came from Babylon. 2 Kings 23 verse 5 actually talks about that because this is when Josiah comes along and deals with it. 2 Kings 23 verse 5, and he put down the idolatrous priests, and your margin will, will tell you that's the Kemarim. Keep that in mind because we're going to have a look at Zephaniah in a moment. And the Kemarim are mentioned there in their black robes. This was the lower order of the priests of Samaramis. This were the ones who were outside the door, remember? These were the ones who stoked the fires. And of course when you're stoking fires you do tend to get charcoal on your garments. It shows up on red, but it doesn't show up on black. So they were the lower order of priests, the Kemarim. <clears throat> and so, it goes on to say in that verse whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah, in the places round about Jerusalem. Them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, and to the planets, and to all the host of heaven. But Josiah had to get rid of all of that stuff. So that's what Manasseh brought into Judah. <clears throat> In 2 Kings 23 verse 11, when Josiah is dealing with the remnants of this worship, we read, And he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the sun at the entering in of the house of Yahweh by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain which was in the suburbs. And he burned the chariots of the sun with fire. Sun? Yeah. That was Nimrod. And when he died... Tamils came along. So the old sun goes down, you know, December 25th, new one's born. You know, death of Nimrod, <coughs> birth of Tamils, chariots of the sun. That was installed next to the temple in Judah. Can you imagine what Yahweh thinks about all this? And how long did this go on for? 50 years. And that's why, of course, it was impossible for Josiah to save the bulk of his people. He tried very hard. You know, after 50 years, people are too far gone. The, the idolatry has become part of their everyday life. And it's like, it's like um, the Assyrian messenger said to Hezekiah, you, know, you don't want to follow Hezekiah, he's the one that's got rid of all your, your, your orders and stuff. You know, he's talking about getting rid of the false orders. <laughs> But see, it's accepted. That's the way you do things. Well, <clears throat> what did God do about all this? Wherefore Yahweh brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with feathers and carried him to Babylon. Now, I want you to think about that. It was the Assyrians who came down. They didn't take him back to Assyria. Did you know that at this time of history the Assyrians and the Babylonians weren't getting on very well? They were not good friends. So why would they take him to Babylon? Well, we don't know how that happened. We don't know why it happened. But we do know this, is that Manasseh, whose name means causing to forget, was in fact a microcosm of his own people. Because he introduced Babylonian idolatry, the only way that God could get rid of that idolatry from Manasseh and later on from his people was to send them to the heart, to the homeland of idolatry. You know, when you actually live in the middle of the mud, you know what mud's like, don't you? When you're at the bottom of the barrel, you know how low you can go. 
So God says to his people, you are so steeped in idolatry, the only thing I can do with you is to send you to the home of idolatry until you learn to hate it. And when some of you hate it, not all of them did, when some of you hate it, I'll bring you home. It took them 70 years. That's why he sent them there. God sent Judah, and really you could call it Israel, because by that time there was all the tribes of Israel in Judah. He sent his nation to Babylon to be free from idolatry. And do you know it's a fact that when the Jews came back from Babylon, they have never, ever served idols of wood and stone again. Or they served idols, the idol of covetousness and money, yeah, and they're in, you know, they're in the vanguard of the corruption of the world through the film industry and all that sort of... But they have never bowed down to, the, to idols of wood and stone again. Cured them of that. That's why God sent them there. And see, Manasseh was a model for his own people. That's where God sent him, even though at the time the Assyrians and Babylonians weren't getting on. He ended up in the home of idolatry. And we know what happened to Manasseh, don't we? We know that there he repented. And it was a genuine repentance. And God brought him home, put him back on the throne. In fact, I think most of you will accept that Manasseh will probably be in the kingdom. But probably about two or three million people won't be because of what he did. That's the way it is. If you repent like he did, then God will forgive. He couldn't, he couldn't ignore the blood that flowed through the streets of Jerusalem because Manasseh slaughtered anybody who opposed him. He couldn't forget all of that. And he certainly wasn't able to accept people who hadn't turned like Manasseh their king. But he did show mercy to Manasseh. Well, he took him off to Babylon through the Assyrians <coughs> and he was free from idolatry. He was the forerunner, as we said, of his own people, Judah, who had, who had been corrupted by his Babylonian apostasy. Now, for those of you, I'm not going to take you to Micah 4, verse 10, for the sake of it, but for those of you who want to look that up, Micah 4, verse 10, talks about Judah going into captivity to Babylon. And they're taken into the field, it says, and uh, that's because it was to remove from them that idolatry. So what was God doing to try and reverse the idolatry and the apostasy, the Baal worship of Manasseh, king of Judah? Well, he raised up after him Josiah. I don't know about you, but I think Josiah is one of the most marvellous characters in history. He had everything stacked against him. He didn't even have a Bible until he was 26 years of age. Never laid his eyes on the Bible. But he was the greatest reformer of the latter portion of that people's history. And his reformation, of course, failed largely because they were too far gone. But he did save some. He saved people like Daniel and his three friends and others like that. But God didn't just raise up Josiah. He raised up two other prophets at least. There were others, but two at least. One of them was Jeremiah. He began to prophesy in the 13th year of Josiah, when Josiah was 21. And the other one was Zephaniah. All right? Zephaniah happened to be of the royal family. Happened to be related to Josiah. And Zephaniah's prophecy, for those of you who have heard that study on Zephaniah, is one of the ma most magnificent little prophecies. The jewel. It's a jewel. You know, they call it that it's among the minor prophets. Come on. It is a huge stepping stone between Genesis and Revelation. Zephaniah is an absolutely fabulous little book. I want to talk briefly about it tonight. So you might want to join me in the prophecy of Zephaniah. Now Zephaniah was a descendant of Hezekiah. Now you read that in Zephaniah 1 and verse 1. The word of Yahweh which came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, and I'll make a brief comment about that in a minute, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hizkiah. Now, Hizkiah is Hezekiah. 
So he's, he's a descendant of David. He's part of the royal family and therefore he has access to the king. And of course Josiah came to the throne at eight years of age and boys of eight don't rule kingdoms all that well. He needed help. He had help, of course, from two faithful men, Shaphan the scribe and Hilkiah the high priest. And Hilkiah the high priest was the father of Jeremiah. So there's access to Jeremiah there as well. And these boys, Jeremiah, Josiah, Zephaniah, basically grew up together. And it was Zephaniah's prophecies that initiated, I believe, Josiah's reformation. You've only got to read the prophecy to know that. He prophesied between 630 and 621 BC during the early years of Josiah's reign. He was contemporary with Jeremiah who began prophesying in Josiah's 13th. As I said, he's seemingly responsible for Josiah's early reforms. Now Zephaniah's name means whom Yahweh hid. But you see, it says in verse 1, he was the son of Cushai. Now, I ask you, Cushai, by the way, means a Cushai, going right back to the Cush, the father of Nimrod. I ask you, what idiot would name his son after the Pope? Same name again, uh, Yeah. <laughs> well, that means fool. He was an idiot. <laughs> But, but who would do that? I mean, if you had a child, would you name him Francis? Son? you name him Francis? If he was born three years ago, would you name him Benedict? Of course you wouldn't. So you've got to ask yourself the question, why would anybody name their son after the father of Nimrod? Well, because you see, their worship was Babylonian. The whole of Judah was steeped in Babylonian worship. There's nothing unusual about that. If you're a Catholic, you name them after Catholics, don't you? That's what Judah was. So that's one of the things. You read that and you think, well, there's got to be a reason for that. There was a reason for that. And the name Cush occurs three times in Zephaniah. You know that in each chapter. Cush is three times in three chapters of the book of Zephaniah. There are only three chapters. So there's something interesting here. Now Gedaliah is, is there, the name Gedaliah, whom Yahweh has made great, Amariah, whom Yah has promised, his car, of course, strengthened of Yah. He had, he had a pretty good heritage, but unfortunately it appears as though his, his grandfather, <coughs> his grandfather was imbued with the apostasy of Manasseh. So what Zephaniah is about, and, and by the way, this is... His name is actually inferred in chapter 2. If you have a look at verse 3 of Zephaniah chapter 2, it says this. Seek ye Yahweh, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of Yahweh's anger. Zephaniah's name means whom Yahweh hid. So he represents that little remnant. Salvation of a remnant whom God hid among the Cushites, the, the Babylonians, and made great through the one he promised to Abraham and strengthened for himself. So we've strung those names together. It really does tell the story of the prophecy of Zephaniah. So let's analyse this prophecy briefly. In chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, 3, we have hastening judgments bearing down upon Judah because of the apostasy of Manasseh. Chapter 2, verses 4 to 15, we have judgment on the nations. And we're going to see when we get to that little section. Actually, while it has relevance to what happened in ancient times, it really points to the times in which we live. In chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, we have the sins of Judah and of Jerusalem spelled out. In chapter 3, verses 8 to 20, we have a remnant restored and redeemed. So the purpose of the prophecy is to encourage a faithful remnant in the face of rapidly approaching divine judgments. And without going into all the proofs, the roots of the prophecy of Zephaniah are found in Genesis 1, the 35. All of this prophecy is drawn from the book of Genesis. It's a marvellous little book. So let's just briefly point that out. Here's the roots of the prophecy. In Zephaniah 1, verses 2 and 3, we read these words. 
I will utterly consume all things from off the land, or the face of the land as it should be, saith Yahweh. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea. Where have you read language like that before? Genesis 1. So what we have here is the language of Genesis 1 and the order of creation is reversed. It's your first clue. Your first clue. Because the book of Zephaniah is about God reversing the work of Nimrod. That's what it's about. Reversing the work of Nimrod. In Zephaniah 2 verse 3, you read language that is based upon the flood. All consumed. Might be, that might actually be chapter 1 verse 3. That should be. I'm sure of that. Zephaniah 1 verse 1, 2, 12 and 3, 10, we have that word Cushai or Cush used. It refers to the original Cush, the area of Babylon. In Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 13, we've got Assyria and Nineveh brought into the, into the prophecy. In Zephaniah 1, 16 and 3, 6, there's mention of towers. Towers? Yeah, because you see it taking us back to Genesis and to the Tower of Babel. And cities, yes, taking us back to Genesis 10 and to the first great city builder after the flood. And in Zephaniah 3 verse 9, you can't miss the point. We mentioned it a little earlier today. You've got the word Safar used, which first occurs in Genesis 11 verse 1. I will return or turn to the peoples a pure lip, a pure tongue, based upon Genesis 11 verse 1. Pure language. In other words, a pure religion. And in Zephaniah 3, 9 to 20, you've got Abraham and Jacob, their seed redeemed. Promises made to Abraham seem to be fulfilled. So without going, oh, I can't do that. I mean, this is a Bible school study. I mean, we take five or six sessions, you still don't get through this. So I can't do all the detail. But just to give you a feel for where the background of Zephaniah comes from, it's all drawn from Genesis and it's all revolving around Nimrod and what God did to answer Nimrod's challenge. He raised up Abraham. He called Abraham out of Ur the Chaldees. That's the background to this prophecy. So what about Nimrod? His name's not mentioned in the prophecy but he's all over the place. He's omnipresent. The word Cush, of course, his father occurs three times. Goes right back to Genesis 2.13. Towers and cities are there. The high towers of chapter 1 verse 16. The word nations is used seven times. That comes from way back in, you remember, a study in Genesis 12? I rise up to the prey. Look at chapter 3 verse 8. Wait, says Yahweh. Wait upon me until the, that I rise up to the prey. Oh, and that's an illusion, isn't it? Nimrod was a mighty hunter. And so Yahweh's going to hunt him now. And that word language, Safa, that we saw in chapter 3, verse 9, drawn from Genesis 11, verse 1. And the Nineveh and Assyria of chapter 2, verse 13, which speaks about the military phase of the kingdom of men. So there are just some of the little clues. I know that's quick. I know I should give more time to it, but we don't have that time. So hopefully that's enough just to give you the, uh, the, uh, the understanding that this book is actually based upon the history that comes out of Genesis. Now let me just show you some contrasts between Nimrod and Yahweh, the two principal antagonists. In Zephaniah 3 verse 17, you read this. Yahweh thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save thee. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. The word mighty is Gibor. Nimrod was a mighty Gibor. A Gibor, a warrior, in the face of Yahweh, says Genesis 10, 8 and 9. Same term is used. In Zephaniah 3, 15, we read, Yahweh hath taken away thy judgment. He hath cast out the name. The king of Israel, even Yahweh, is in the midst of them. Yeah, it's an illusion. Back to Genesis 10 verse 10. The beginning of Nimrod's kingdom. In Zephaniah 3 verse 8. Wait for me until I write up the prey. He was a hunter. Yahweh will be a hunter. Nimrod was a mighty hunter. 
Zephaniah 3, 12, 19 and 20, we have reference to the name. And then what word is? Shem. Verse 12 says, I also will leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall, they shall trust in the Shem of Yahweh. And you find that word again used in verse 19, it's rendered fame, and again in verse 20, rendered name. That takes us back to Genesis 11, verse 4. Let us make us a Shem. Language, Zephaniah 3, verse 9, as we pointed out, comes from Genesis 11, 1 and 11, 9. Okay? So on the one side you've got confusion, on the other side you've got a pure language. This is what the book of Zephaniah is all about. Rotherham translates Zephaniah 2, verse 11 this way. Let's just read the AV. It says, Zephaniah 2 and verse 11, Yahweh will be terrible unto them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth. And men shall worship him, every one from his place, even all the isles of the heathen. Rotherham translates it, all the gods of the earth, that men may may bow down to him, every one from his place, all the coastlands of the nations. So what that tells us is that while Zephaniah 2 turns in verse 4 to God's judgment on the nations, God was not just thinking about the nations of that time. He was thinking about the future. Because here is a prophecy about God famishing, that is, denying the gods of this world any worship. He's going to famish them. When the kingdom is established, he's going to abolish these gods that all men might bow down to him. And they will not feed their own gods with offerings, whatever they might give to their gods. So you see, you've got to keep in mind when you're dealing with Zephaniah's prophecy that while it has a relevance and a purpose in that time, it's actually projecting to the future. It's the bigger picture that God has in mind. This is an an endeavour to summarise a book in half an hour that you should take half a year to do. So, it's a bit difficult, but anyway, we'll persist. Because this is the important, the really important area of Zephaniah's prophecy. Verses 8 to 10 of chapter 3. The theme is, Israel's God rises to the prey to reverse Nimrod's rebellion. In verse 8, the nations are assembled for Armageddon and the subsequent judgments. In verse 9, the nations are given a pure religion. In verse 10, scattered Israel is recovered from their dispersion. All coming from Genesis. So let's have a bit of a look at verses 8 and 9. Here they are, in Young's literal translation, just slightly modified. Therefore wait for me, an affirmation of Yahweh, says verse 8, for the day of my rising for prey. For my judgment is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, which, by the way, is the opposite of what happened because of Nimrod's rebellion. They were scattered, weren't they? To pour out on them mine indignation, all the heat of mine anger, for by the fire of my jealousy consumed is all the earth. So that's about Armageddon. Now where does that lead? Well, this is how it ultimates. For then do I turn unto peoples, plural term, a pure lip, pure safar, to call all of them by the name of Yahweh to serve him with one consent. Now you'll notice it says one shoulder. The word consent at the end of Zephaniah 3 verse 9 is Shechem. Now I'm going to ask you to use your brains. When Abraham came into the land, he came first to Shechem which means to shoulder 
a burden. Got to make some decisions. Then he went to Bethel. What did he do at Bethel? He called upon the name of Yahweh. Read it again. God had called Abraham from Ur the Chaldees from the confusion of Babylonian religion. Alright? See where this is going? Well then, after Armageddon, do I turn unto peoples of pure lip, which was confused, time of Nimrod's rebellion, and I call Abraham out to start this process, to call all of them by the name Yahweh. They're going to call upon my name, like he did at Bethel. For what purpose? To serve him with one shekel. One shoulder. See the hints? This gives you a bit of a clue about how expansive is the prophecy of Zephaniah. But stop. In this one verse, Zephaniah 3 verse 8, which happens to be one sentence contains every letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, including what are called final letters. So some Hebrew words have a final letter on them, which is actually part of the alphabet, but it's called a final. So there's another five. So this 22 plus five makes a total of 27 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. All right. Every single one of them is in verse eight in the one sentence. Give me a sentence. Got every letter of the English alphabet. Anyone know a sentence? Got every letter of the English alphabet. Yes, Chris. So what? What does that mean? All right. You've got to make up a nonsense sentence to get every letter of the English alphabet. Don't. You? This is not a nonsense sentence. You see, when God then says in verse 9, I will return to the peoples a pure language, he means his own language. And in the previous verse, he uses every letter of the alphabet of his language. To make it quite plain, he means business. These 27 letters of the alphabet are used at least once in the verse. 27 is 3 times 9. Now, if you put three nines like that and turn them upside down, what do you get? <laughs> six, six, six. That's what this is about. It's about turning upside down the work of Nimrod. Nine is the number of fullness and finality. Three is the number, it's a complete number, it's the number of fruit and result God is going to get a result. He's going to turn the work of Nimrod upside down. 27 equals 10 plus 17. 10 is the biblical number for all. 17 is to a Hebrew absolute completeness because you've got 10 and 7. So you can't get any more complete than that. Total fullness and finality is the message of Zephaniah 3, verse 8. None of that's accidental, is it? Not accidental. So what do we then read in Zephaniah 3? We have verse 8. We've seen what that's about. That's Armageddon and God's determination to reverse Nimrod's work. Rather than scatter, he's going to gather, bring judgment, purify Verse 9, he's going to return to them a pure language, in other words, a pure religion, that they might all call upon him and serve him with one shechem or one shoulder. And then we read in verse 10, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, there's our word Cush, from beyond the rivers of Cush, that's what that word is in the Hebrew, what's he going to do? My suppliants or my worshippers, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering from beyond the rivers of Cush. Yep. God had a purpose. In the call of Abraham, he brought him from beyond the rivers of Cush. Didn't he? 
brought him from beyond the rivers of Cush. And that was the pattern for bringing Israel back to the land. And when Elijah goes out to do his work, which is the subject matter of the end of Zephaniah 3, the same pattern will be followed. Coming from beyond the rivers of Cush. But their Cush, of course, is going to be Europe, where the papacy will be installed in rebellion against Christ. So, what is God's purpose with Abraham? Well, we're told in Isaiah 51, verse 2. Look unto Abraham your father, and to Sarah that bear you, for I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. So he starts with one man. He's not going to finish with one man, is he? It's going to come down here. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, was the promise he made to him right at the end, in the seventh promise of Genesis 22, verse 18. So he starts with one man, he ends up with all the nations of the earth being blessed. That's what this is about. A return to the peoples of pure language. They might all call upon the name of Yahweh to serve him with one shekel. All coming from Genesis. What's God's purpose with Israel as a nation? He said to the nation, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Is he content with that? No. He said, the people Israel shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Is he content with that? Well, that's how he started. It's like he started with Abraham. Nope. He's not going to finish there. Because the promise made concerning his son, Luke 1, based upon Isaiah 9, was this. He, Christ, shall reign over the house of Jacob, that's the name for natural Israel, forever, or for the age, kingdom age, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now that's not about time. Christ's kingdom will have an end. Anybody tell me how long it lasts? thousand years. It's got an end. Then cometh the end. When he will give the kingdom back to God. This is not about time. This is about geography. What this is saying, and it's based on Isaiah 9 verse 6, it's a quotation out of Isaiah 9, is the saying that wherever you go on earth, when Christ's kingdom is fully established, you'll be in his kingdom. Of it there will be no end. You can keep going around and round and round. You'll be in Christ's kingdom. How do we know that's true? Well, let me ask you a question. Isaiah 9 verse 7 says, Of the increase of his kingdom and of, his, and of peace, increase of his government and peace, there should be no end. How do you increase government? So starting with Armageddon, progressing out, taking over all nations, you increase government, and what do you do then? You increase peace, because nobody's fighting against you in the end, are they? It's not about time. It's about extent. It's about territory. So he starts with Israel, ends up with the whole earth. Now, those of you who are really interested in that principle want to have a look at Psalm 59, verse 13. Just jot that one down, and we'll come back to that later. Psalm 59, verse 13. 59, <clears throat> so this is the story. The call of Abram from beyond the rivers of Cush foreshadowed the 40-year mission of Elijah to bring Israel back to the land. And when he does, he'll bring them across the Euphrates and also across the Red Sea, it says in Isaiah 11. In the second exodus of Israel, they'll be baptised, brought into the bonds of the covenant, returned to the land, Call upon the name of Yahweh and serve him with one shoulder. That's what God's going to do for Israel. Just like he did for Abraham. So brethren, whenever you come to the book of Zephaniah, do not relegate it to the minor prophets. There is no such thing as a minor prophet. Zephaniah is a giant stepping stone between Genesis and Revelation. Yes, Isaiah draws on Genesis. Jeremiah draws on Genesis. Daniel draws on Genesis. Obviously. But Zephaniah is absolutely huge. 
And it takes us to the apocalypse. It's meant for that reason. It's in the Bible for that reason. Right in the middle. This huge stepping stone. In our next session, we're going to have a look at the two women of Zechariah 5 and a house in the land of Shinar.